Thank you so much for inviting and thank you for coming today. Um, I have a few stories today to share with you and um, I hope we after that can have a lot of discussions and questions, etc. So just a quick introduction to the skin. Um, of course, uh, skin, as all of you know from Shiri's work, is our protective barrier that protects us against infection, dehydration. It helps us to protect our body against the UV radiation of the sun, and I guess you guys <laughs> know what it is more than us in New York. It also helps to keep those nasty bacteria and viruses away from our body and um, not infecting our body all the time. But, and this is what we always think about the skin, it's our protective barrier. But also, if you think about, it's also a very important sensory organ because all your sensations, either you touch somebody or somebody touched you, or you experience hot or cold surface, or even pain. If you think about all of those sensations somehow has to be transmitted through the skin layers, right, into the uh, central nervous system. And then you know, oh, somebody touched me and I have to turn back. Oh, this is a hot surface, I need to react to this, right? And so we now start thinking about the skin as this important sensory organ and trying to understand how this interaction between sensory nervous system and epidermal keratinocytes is working in order to perceive those sensations. So we cannot work on all types of sensations. We chose one and they called light touch sensation. So let me introduce you this because you actually experience those type of sensations in everyday uh, activities. So in the morning, when you decided to put the clothes, you touch it and you say, oh, this is too rough for me to wear today. I want something smooth, something nice like PJs. Um, this is the type of sensation that you put your fingertips through the surface of the clothes and um, this allow you to decide what you want to wear today. Of course, when you pet your favorite animal, those nice sensation of the fur, this is also light touch sensations. I have to, of course, remind you that every time you type your grant or paper on your keyboard, that when you recognize the edges of the buttons, this is a light touch sensation. It allows you to, to feel those shapes and say, oh, I'm pressing the button now versus not. And of course, a simple task as recognizing the edges of the button when you put your uh, short in the morning. So how those uh, light touch sensations are uh, delivered to our body? Well, it's actually two cell types that allow us to sense those light touch sensations. First cell types, Merkel cells, and second are sensory neurons. So how does it work? This is epidermis, and this is kind of my cartoon showing that uh, you're applying the touch, you touch something, you're applying pressure. So this pressure is transmitted through the layers of the epidermis, the Merkel cells are located in the epidermis, and then they activate piezo 2 channels, which are expressed in uh, Merkel cells. And as you know, a few years ago, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of the piezo 2 channels. So that results in uh, activation of channels leading to depolarization of the membrane and release of neurotransmitters that are synthesized in Merkel cells, release them so then they can go and bind to the receptors on the sensory neurons, then you get activation of the signal and you know that um, you uh, touch something. The studies in mice showed that if mice lack Merkel cells and we have models where Merkel cells are not formed during development, those mice actually will be born fine, but if you apply touch stimulus, the sensory neurons cannot get activated. So what it told us is that the Merkel cell are this intermediate cell type, mechanoreceptor cells that sense the touch and then they transmit it to the neurons. And of course, those mice in the behavioral assay for recognition of the say texture were not able to discriminate different surfaces. They were indifferent to that. So not only the lack of Merkel cells resulted in lack of firing from neurons, but also to the behavioral alterations. So the surprise was that these Merkel cells that expressed ion channel, neurotransmitters, piezo 2 channels, that during development, the cells originate from embryonic epidermal progenitors. These are the same cells that give rise to epidermal keratinocytes or hair follicles or sweat glands. But if you look at the electron microscopy, Merkel cells don't look anything like epithelial cells. They, by the expression profile, they, the way they look like uh, under EM studies, they look completely different, more like a neuronal cells. So the discovery that was done by Cedric Blampin, uh, Steve Maricic, and others really opened uh, sort of 
key question to us, how then differentiation, a commitment of the same cells that give rise to epidermis and hair follicle also can give rise to Merkel cells? So when we start thinking about these questions, of course, the first thing to do is that we isolated the cells. We did our own. We also um, explored the published data from Ellen Lumpkin's lab. And then we selected a classes of Merkel cell signature genes. This would be something that only expressed in Merkel cells, but not expressed in epidermal progenitors before they committed to Merkel cells or in any of the cells of the epidermis or hair follicles. So we have our markers of Merkel cells. And we wanted to know when those markers are start being expressed to start elucidating how the Merkel cell uh, uh, development is formed. So in mice, the, f the, the first uh, appearance of the Merkel cell markers would be at embryonic day 15. And at that time point, the cells will express two transcription factors, ATO1 and SOX2. No other markers will be expressed. One day later, they start expressing ISL1 transcription factor and start expressing cytokeratin 8. One day later, they continue to express all of those genes, but also start expressing even more cytos uh, cytoskeletal uh, genes, keratin 18, 20. At that time, they will start expressing ion channels, neurotransmitters, etc. And later on, a mature Merkel cell that will live in the body of mice will express all of those cells. What was really critical and was curious to us is as soon as we see the appearance of these first markers, we never saw incorporation of BRDU in those cells. So what it tells us is as a cell commit from epidermal progenitors, they don't divide anymore. They start undergoing this maturation process where the transcription factors and cytoskeleton proteins and other proteins start being expressed to make mature Merkel cells, but they do not divide, okay? And of course we, um, and also the field, spend a lot of time to identifying what is the role of the three transcription factors. We knew that without ATO1, Merkel cells are absent in the mouse body, but we identified that ATO1 is required for the first differentiation step. They cannot transition to this initial uh, step uh, if you'd like in ATO1. So ATO1 is really the early uh, differentiation factor. ISL1, on the other hand, we identify is more of a maturation pro uh, transcription factor. Uh, the cells without ISL1 will never mature properly, but the initial stages of differentiation are core fine. We also were very curious about this coexistence between ATO1 and SOX2 because they really come up at the same time. And we explored why that is the case by identifying that SOX2 actually promotes transcription of ATO1. If mice lacking SOX2, um, ATO1 transcription goes down. If you do opposite and you overexpress SOX2, transcription of ATO1 goes up. And then we also showed by performing cheap assay that the reason how the SOX2 regulates A to one expression is through binding to the enhancer element in the prom in a promoter element of A to one gene. So this is a chip, uh, chip qPCR data showing that SOX2 binds to enhancer element and it binds to its own regulatory elements throughout the regulatory loop. So SOX2 regulates expression of A to one and without SOX2, if we ablate SOX2 in early embryonic epidermal progenitors and only those cells, the Merkel cell formation will be abrogated and there will be much less of this A to one cell specified. So we were discovering those transcription factors and we wanted to know how the Merkel cell differentiation process is encoded in epidermal progenitors. As I said, it happened, the progenitor cells give rise to Merkel cells and then Merkel cell maturation occurring without division, but how this process is encoded in the progenitors. So when we were exploring this uh, question, we were very surprised to see that ATO1, ISL1, and SOX2 gene that are not expressed in epidermal progenitors, they are repressed by one complex, and that complex is called polycom repressive complex. Not only these three transcription factors, but actually also cytoskeletal proteins specific to Merkel cells, and a lot of other genes that what makes the Merkel cell Merkel cell also under polycom repression. So what is this complex? So this is a chromatin repressor complex, and by definition, the, what, how it works, it compacts chromatin, so the transcriptional machinery, such as polymerase II or general transcriptional factors, will have harder time or in, enable to recruit to the promoters of the genes that are in this compacted state, and they will stay in silenced or not expressed uh, state. So the polycom complex, uh, and specifically the polycom repressive complex two, consists of several subunits, 
and the main function of those uh, proteins to come together to establish histone methylation on the lysine residue 27. This histone mark is what promotes chromatin compaction resulting in gene repression. So of course we ask, okay, um, what would happen if we remove the polycomb repression in epidermal progenitors? We see that all this Merkel cell lineage is repressed by this one complex. How about we remove polycomb repression and see what happens? So we did that by using a K14 Cree line. It's the beautiful line where K14 is expressed in early epidermal progenitors start to express before any Merkel cell differentiation start happening. And we ablated ED gene, which is essential subunit of this complex, and the complex falls apart if you don't have it. As a result, we saw that these epidermal progenitors upregulate expression of the three transcription factors that I showed to you required for Merkel cell differentiation. They start expressing at the high level. But what's the consequence? Is this something, is just genes get expressed, or is there a physiological reason behind that? Well, we identified that without polycomb repression in epidermal progenitors, their ectopic Merkel cells are formed throughout the body. So this is a whole mount as uh, IF of the back skin of control mice or the ED conditional knockout mice, and we're staying for cytokeratin 8, which is specific to Merkel cells. As you can see here from the slide, Merkel cells have in control have this very nice localization. They're very spatially organized, and each of those clusters called touch dome contains around 30 Merkel cells. I will come back to you in a few slides, and we're going to discuss why they're so nicely organized and uh, how this organization is established. So hold, hold on to that. But as you can see here, without polycomb repression, you see how many more of these yellow cells are formed in, uh, throughout the body, not in only in this highly organized structure that we had in the control cells. So loss of polycomb repression not only resulted in the repression of Merkel cell uh, uh, transcription factors, but also led to ectopic Merkel cell formation. So now let's discuss why Merkel cells are organized this way. So we're looking at the back skin of mice. As you know, mice have a lot of fur on their back skin. And it turns out that Merkel cells organized in this beautiful touch dome structure or clusters, not randomly they are localized and located around hair follicles. And not all the hair follicles that mice have, there are many, many of them, so one specific type called guard hairs or primary hair follicles. What those are is that the hair follicles that are formed the first in the formation of the hair coat, and these are the longest and the biggest mice hair that they have, and they're sticking quite far from the surface of the mouse body. So Merkel cells are located around this specific uh, hair type. This hair type is not, uh, uh, it's, very, it's uh, around one to 3%. So 97% of hair follicles do not have the Merkel cell clusters. Only the guard hair, which is around 3%, will have Merkel cells associated with them. So we very then, of course, a question I was interested to know um, why this interesting localization and is there a, a cross communication between hair follicle formation, which was studied quite a lot by Leila Fuchs, Fiona Watt, and many others in the field, and Merkel cell formation, because that was understudied. So then we went back and started asking when in the time points when hair follicles are formed, when the Merkel cells appear. And before any hair follicles are formed, we actually don't see any Merkel cells. And in the first formation of the hair follicles called placodes, as you can see, the hair is just starting to grow. We also don't see any of the Merkel cell markers appear. However, one day later, when the hair follicle a little bit elongated a little bit further, this is a time point when the first Merkel cells start appearing and we can detect them using our markers of Merkel cells that we, ident we and other people identified. One day later, the Merkel cells are now positioned in this interfollicular epidermis around the hair follicle. And from that time point, they will stay there, just increase in their numbers until around P0 or a little bit later, postnatal life. But this is how they're going to be uh, uh, located from now on. So then we knew from, again, from the work of so many labs in the hair follicle field that different stages in hair formation associated with specific signaling events that are occurring. For example, wind is one of the first event in order to form hair placodes, and sonic is appearing at this stage and it's required for hair to continue growing downwards. 
So then we ask, is sonic signaling also required to specify Merkel cell lineage? We uh, used sonic straight knockout, but also did conditional knockout where we ablated sonic in uh, embryonic epidermal progenitors using our K1503 line. And as you can see here from the slides, this completely abrogate any uh, Merkel cell formation. There was absolutely no Merkel cells formed. So sonic it seems to be required for Merkel cell formation. And then we start looking on the sonic signaling, right? As all of you know, sonic is a ligand that binds to patch receptor and activate a cascade of reactions inside of the cells in order to express the GLEWA, a sonic um, uh, responding genes. So our hope was that Merkel cells are the one that receiving sonic signaling, therefore they will be have active GLE1. But when we looked at it, actually Merkel cells don't have any sonic signaling activity. As you can see here, this is in situ hybridization for GLE1. The cells around surrounding the Merkel cells are highly positive for GLE1, but Merkel cells themselves are GLE1 largely negative. So how can it be if sonic is required, but then sonic signaling is not active in Merkel cells, how can it work? While we're working on this, a beautiful paper from Isaac Brownell from NIH came out telling us through the lineage tracing experiments that GLE1 positive sonic responding cells are Merkel cell progenitors. He used GLE1 CREA reporters and performed li beautiful lineage tracing experiments telling that Merkel cells originate from GLE1 positive cells. But during development, there's so many cells that are sonic responding. Is there a specific population among them that true Merkel cell progenitors or, um, or there are many of them? So we wanted to address that question. And so many of the experiments that I don't have time to show to you, we identified this population. We identified that there's a SOX9 population inside of the hair follicles that give rise to Merkel cells during development. This is a lineage tracing experiment where we're using SOX9 CREAR mice uh, coupled with MTMG reporter. And as you can see here, if we activate the moxifen very early before any Merkel cells formation is start to happen, and we analyze later at newborn what, when I, where from which cells are Merkel cells are formed, we see that more than 90% of them, of them are formed from the SOX9 positive cells. And SOX9 are the ones that are sonic responding cells. So just to summarize this first part that highlighting our studies on Merkel cell development, the previous uh, uh, work uh, told us that Merkel cells originate from epidermal progenitors. We were able to help and contribute to the field by showing that Sonic signaling is one of the initial steps that required to specify SOX9 population of Merkel cell progenitors. If it doesn't happen, Merkel cells will not be formed. And SOX9 cells give rise to Merkel cells. This process occurring through the uh, Merkel cell differentiation process where the three key transcription factors play a role. 801 and SOX2 are required for early stages of Merkel cell differentiation with ISIL-1 more of maturation step. And polycom sitting on top of this, repressing this Merkel cell differentiation transcription factors, as well as other Merkel cell lineage genes, preventing inappropriate formation of Merkel cells. And when the polycom is, repression is lost, we have those ectopic Merkel cells are formed. Of course, our next step was what's happening in adulthood during homeostasis. Are the Merkel cells, can they regenerate? Are they more static? If it can regenerate, is there a population of Merkel cell progenitors that is present in the body of the mice uh, regenerating those cells? So of course we start looking from just from our developmental studies, uh, is there a population that could be the same working in adult mice, which are SOX9 cells? And indeed SOX9 cells are present inside of the hair follicles. And you can see here, they regenerate the hair follicles uh, throughout the life of these mice. So if we label the perform lineage tracing experiment using SOX9 CREAR and start uh, putting tamoxifen at postnatal day 22, which is kind of like young teenagers, young adults, the mice still growing in their body, they will still reach their full size in a few weeks later. We can see that if we inject at this time point and analyze at P25 and a little bit later, we can start seeing that the Merkel cells that are formed are GFP labeled. So they are coming from SOX9 cells. But if you look later at postnatal day 50 and then a few months later, there's really no statistical significant increase in the label. So during kind of this early adulthood when mice are growing in size, 
Merkel cells are coming from SOX9 cells. But this told us that maybe when the mice reach their size and they're adults now, maybe SOX9 doesn't really contribute that much. So we did experiment to test that now by injecting tamoxifen at postnatal day 50. Now these are adults that reach their size and they're not going to increase anymore. And here you see this, the hair follicles are beautifully labeled. However, the Merkel cells are completely um, negative for um, GFP signal. So telling us that in when my, mice reach their age and during normal homeostasis, uh, Merkel cells do not come from SOX9 population, and we trace it uh, for a year after that. So is SOX9 population play any role? We wanted to address this question by performing injury. So we want, our rationale was maybe during normal homeostasis, when mice just live in their cage, don't do much, they reach their size, we don't need my Merkel cell replenishment. But if we maybe stimulate the injury, maybe then the cells will be able to regenerate Merkel cells. And we didn't want to do any crazy injury, like big wound, wounds on those mice. We wanted to do something small, like shave our mice a few times or wax, our skin, wax, wax the skin of those mice. So not like a huge wound response. And now, as you can see here, now in, during this mild injury, we saw that the Merkel cell that regenerate and they actually go down upon those injuries. We see that now the Merkel cells that are formed are GFP labeled. So SOX9 cell stays as a population in, mar in her a body of mice capable to regenerate Merkel cells upon mild injury. But again, you're going to ask, Elena, but there's so many cells that are labeled with GFP. There's so many cells. What is the population in the adult skin that are Merkel cell progenitors? Are they all or there's some specific one? So we went and asked that question. Uh, in collaboration with Maria Kasper from Karolinska, uh, through the performing of single flower and seek data, I don't have time to show it to you, we identify a population, a subpopulation within the SOX9 positive cells that are Merkel cell progenitors. The cells expressed marker, TNS and C, and as you can see here, this is the Merkel cells in white labeled here. The cells here, uh, the red, are this labeling for TNS and C, so they're on top of the Merkel cells. Um, this is just to show you the tenescency cells express SOX9. The SOX9, as you can see here, expressed on so many cells of the hair follicle lineage, but the tenescency positive cells also express SOX9. And when we perform lineage tracing experiment, now, now using the TNC CREAR promoter uh, and analyzing whether or not the TNC cells can give rise to Merkel cells, we again saw similar results what we observed in SOX9. During normal homeostasis, don't do much. However, upon mild injury, I'm showing you the waxing. We also did uh, repeated shaving. Now, the, uh, compared to unwaxed to wax conditions, we see that the Merkel cells that are regenerated are tomato positive. So to summarize this part now, uh, what we showed is that there's a population of Merkel cell uh, progenitors that are located in adult skin, and they are cells that express intenescency. Normally, those cells sitting there, they, they proliferate, they regenerate themselves, but they don't really replenish Merkel cells that are located here. However, upon injury, Merkel cells numbers go down, and then the cells get mobilized. They not only proliferate, in, increase their proliferation, but they now are capable to give rise to Merkel cells, differentiate, and replenish the Merkel cells. So current work in this uh, part is focused on a few different directions. First of all, we are very interested to know how injury results in a, a loss or decrease in a number of Merkel cells. What we're doing with our mice is repeated shaving or waxing. We don't really damage our epidermis that much. It's not the huge wounds that we create. And in fact, the uh, tenescency cells themselves are not injured. So how is it the skin senses that something happened resulting in a selective decrease in the number of Merkel cells? So we don't know that, and we're very curious to know what are the pathways that are induced during this injury that result in a reduction of Merkel cells. And of course, we want to know how those cells now, uh, what pathways are activated that they give rise to our Merkel cells to regenerate Merkel cells. We also extrapolate our work to understand how those lineages that we identify, TN, uh, uh, TNC positive cells, SOX9 cells, are, how they contribute, if at all, to Merkel cell carcinoma, which is a rare skin cancer 
but that's quite little and we don't yet have effective treatment for this uh, cancer. So we wanted to know, we already started working on this in some publication, but we wanted to know more. Can we use our knowledge on modeling or understanding homeostasis of Merkel cells to generate mouse model of Merkel cell carcinoma and understand where they're coming from, what is the origin of cells for Merkel cell carcinoma in order to design the specific treatment that will target those cells. And of course, we explore a lot in MCC and additional work that I don't have time to show to you, what regulates Merkel cell carcinoma growth and how can we, using the specific therapies to try to uh, kill selectively those tumors and not um, normal cells. So now I want to switch gears and stop talking about light touch sensation and go back to talking a bit about barrier function, which I think is what our epidermis, one of the main role is, is to protect our body from um, environment. And I wanted to remind you that in the absence of polycom, we saw this increase in the number of Merkel cells. But when we looked at other lineages and we looked extensively, for example, here on the epidermis, we didn't see any alterations. So epidermis was absolutely fine. And we really went uh, extensively on that by ablating not only ED, but other subunits of this complex. We ablated ED or EZH12 that have redundant function, also 12 And this is why you see those three conditional knockout mice. In all of those experiments, epidermis is absolutely fine. So it seems to be here that is the polycom not really required for uh, formation of the epidermis, or we, we may just not understanding something. So we wanted to revisit the classical uh, books on the polycom regulation, and we knew from those books that polycom repressive complex two has a body, a polycom repressive complex one. And they actually work together, these two complexes work together to establish this chromatin compaction that I said, and, and chromatin repression. So in the, there are two models, how they work together and why they co-occupy those genes. And in one model, it says that PRC2 recruits PRC1. And in a different model, it says PRC1 recruits PRC2. But independently of the models, these two complexes come together to promoters of these genes to compact chromatin. They work together through one of the mechanisms of recruitment. Each of those complexes have enzymatic activity. As I introduced you, PRC2 establishes lysine 27 methylation on the histone H3, already talked about it, and PRC1 has also histone modification. It has ring 1A, ring 1B enzyme that ubiquitinylate histone H2A on the lysine residue 119. So through this enzymatic activity and establishment of the histone mark, uh, this facilitated chromatin compaction and gene repression. So surprise for us came when we start profiling now not only the PRC2-dependent histone mark, but also looking at the PRC1 and PRC1-dependent histone mark. So let's take a look at this ChIP-seq data of, of the Fox purified epidermal progenitors. This is the H3K27 trimethylation established by PRC2, and this is H2A ubiquitinylation established by PRC1. As you can see here, we have a lot of clusters where there's a co-presence co of those histone marks, and this is what the model told us. One recruits the other, and then they establish those histone mark to control gene expression. But then there's a cluster four appeared where we did not see any of the PRC2 histone mark. We saw that uh, PRC1 histone mark present, and we also did chip seek analysis of the PRC1 subunit, ring 1B, which is an essential subunit, and it's present. Why I'm spending more time on this cluster four and why it caught our attention? Because these genes located in this cluster were transcriptionally active, right? If polycom is a repressor, how can it be that PRC1 complex is present at transcriptionally active genes? And it's also not only we saw the transcripts present from those genes, we also see the classical transcriptional active mark, lysine like 4 trimethylation, K4 monomethylation, K27 acetylation present at those genes. So these genes are active, yet they have a binding of PRC1. So what's going on? Of course, as mouse geneticists, we wanted to perform loss and function studies now focusing on PRC1. So we ask, let's ablate PRC1 in embryonic epidermal progenitors the same way as we did for PRC2 and see what would be the phenotype. And then we compared the loss of PRC1 and we did it by ablating two key subunits of the PRC1 complex, ring 1A and ring 1B. Again, we're using our K14 Cre line, which ablates very early in embryonic epidermal progenitors before any of the lineages are formed. 
And then as you can see here, the epidermis of those uh, mice was completely different from PRC2 knockout, which as I told you was normal. But in PRC1 knockout, we start seeing formation of blisters. You see those holes located here? So the blisters means that attachment of the epidermis to the basement membrane was not uh, efficient. And the blisters appeared when the basal layer cells were dissociating from the uh, basement membrane or when the basal cells were se separating from the suprabasal cells. Bottom line is, this reminded us a lot of skin blistering disorders, epidermis bullosa, and there's uh, many types of those where in, the, in, the, in those patients that are born with those diseases, epidermis in those patients comes off of their surface. And as you can imagine, this is very um, affect, uh, you know, can be very uh, dangerous because those patients are susceptible to infection and a lot of them die, unfortunately, from the infection. So the phenotype of this loss of adhesion and formation of the skin blistering disorders reminded that a lot of those patients. So we wanted to know, so what are the genes that now changed in the epidermal cells without this polycom repressive complex one activity that led to this phenotype? We first looked at the genes that got upregulated in uh, uh, PRC1 knockout epidermal progenitors. We're isolating them from newborn skin. And largely what we saw that the genes that got upregulated in those knockout epidermal cells were, I would classify them as non-skin lineage genes. This is a gold terms analysis. Basically, these are the genes that never expressed in the epidermis. They involved in heart development, uh, neuronal specification, muscle development. So something that should never be expressed in the epidermis, we saw them now start being expressed. We saw classes of cell adhesion genes. Again, the genes that normally not expressed in the uh, epithelial epidermal cells start being expressed. So the largely the, the phenotype of genes that got upregulated was a lot of genes of non-epidermal lineages start being expressed, okay? What about down-regulated genes? And I want to remind you that we have those cluster four genes, they were transcriptionally active. So most of those genes actually went down in their transcription. And this is a, a showing to you some of those genes. And if you do go term analysis on those genes, they are classical regulative of cell cell adhesion and cell adhesion to the basement membrane. And I hope you can see here the genes that I highlighted in blue because these are the genes that have been identified in those human conditions of skin blistering disorders. Those genes have been shown to be mutated in those conditions. So of course, in our case, we don't have mutations, but what we have is that expression of those genes are drastically downregulated in knockout cells, and this is a log twofold compared to control skin. And none of those genes so, uh, either change the expression in PRC2 knockouts or change very little. So we concluded that the genes that are under PRC1 control now, positive control looks like, those genes that went down, many of them have functional role through the genetic studies in humans, functional role in affecting, in controlling cell cell adhesion and adhesion to the basement membrane. So the idea that PRC1 can be activator of transcription or positive, positive regulator of transcription was very new and surprising to us. We wanted to see if that is indeed the case. I'm showing you one result, we did more. And in this experiment, we took cells in vitro, we plated them and induced them to create knockouts. And what we did is that we monitored those cells over time to see how they become knockouts, how ring 1B slowly goes down and disappearing by five days, and how the histone mark established by PRC1 also disappeared. We then went and did ChIP-seq and RNA-seq analysis, and this is a qPCR data on, of uh, representation of those data, where you can see as the cells become knockout, the ring 1B disappearing from those genes that I showed you on the previous slide, the ring 1B leaves those genes, goes uh, to the uh, base level as shown here on the control, and the transcription of those genes go down at the same kind of rate as uh, PRC1 goes away from this complex or from these genes. So to summarize this part, what we identify is the polycom complex have, I would say, two roles in regulation of epidermal cell identity and integrity. PRC1 and PRC2 function together to repress non-skin lineage genes. We also found that I don't have time to show it to you, and we published this work that 
if you ablate both PRC1 and PRC2, the expression of non-skin lineage genes, again, those muscle, neuronal, uh, heart genes, got upregulated even higher levels than in a single knockout of PRC1 or single knockout of PRC2, telling us there's a redundancy in the repression of those non-skin lineage genes to make sure that these unwanted lineages are not activated. As a consequence in this knockout, when we don't have PRC1 and PRC2, and this non-skin lineages are expressed at the very high level, skin actually cannot, epidermis cannot be specified. It stays at this progenitor state and the epidermal differentiated layers or hair follicle layers cannot be specified. We, we think that this is because the cells are in this confused state. They still, they, they are of epithelial lineage, of epidermal lineage, but then over sudden they start expressing a lot of other lineage genes with many of those genes being transcription factors required to differentiate the cells uh, through the development to muscle, heart, etc. But we also identify that PRC1 can function independently of PRC2 to promote gene expression. And we identify a class of very important genes that are involved in cell adhesion to keep the epidermis attached to the base of the membrane and keep the layers of the epidermis attached to each other to provide this integrity, the barrier function of the epidermis. And without that, just genes are not expressed anymore at the, the proper level, and we have those blistering phenotypes that I showed you. So where are we taking this from now? Um, of course, we're moving to um, now homeostasis, understanding of adult skin regulation, and skin diseases. So I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not gonna show you some uh, data on that. It's published. We study um, regulation of adult epidermis and we identify some very interesting phenotypes on that. We're very interested in hair follicle stem cell regulation in the context of polycom. We published on that and we have uh, also other stories coming on that. But in general, how the hair follicle transition from activation to quiescence is regulated and how then hair knows where to grow, when to grow and how it responds to environmental signals inside of the hair follicle stem cells to grow hair. And I wanna share with you uh, the final story that is uh, kind of still in the works um, on our uh, work on the squamous cell carcinoma formation and the role of polycom in this disease. So as uh, many of you know, the squamous cell carcinoma is one of the most prevalent skin cancers worldwide. And we started this project through collaborations with pathology department um, at Mount Sinai, where we could obtain the skin samples from normal skin of patients or from the patients who suffered from um, stage 1, 2 or 3, 4 of SCC. And we stained for the, our favorite histone marks related to polycom as well as the other histone marks. As you can see here, what we observed is that normally, and we knew this from mouse work, that um, the histone mark estab uh, established by PRC2 complex is quite strong in normal human skin, but in stage 1, 2 or 3, 4, the level of this histone mark decreases. And I want to highlight you this part because this is the area, this is a basal layer where epidermal progenitor cells that fueling the epidermis are located, and you see that H3K27 is strong in these cells. And the same thing in tumors, the cells located in this um, uh, layer are called uh, tumor propagating cells, they proliferate and they're fueling more differentiated cells that are located here. So again, the histone mark, there was drastic decrease in the level of this histone mark from a normal skin going to stage one, two, and three, four. If the histone mark goes down, we thought uh, that maybe one of the subunits of this complex goes down. And so then we took the same samples that we had, but now performed uh, IHC studies for each of the subunits of the PRC2 complex. So long story short, SOS12 and EZH2 are not downregulated in the human SCC samples, but ED uh, uh, we showed very similar pattern as we saw for the histone mark. Again, ED normally present in this basal layer of the epidermis where epidermal progenitors are located, but in the tumors that we see that EEG goes down. And then we correlated because we have the same sections. We correlated the levels of EED with the levels of the histone mark. And as you can see here in the tumors where we saw weak level for EED, we also saw weak level for HDK27, suggesting to us that a, uh, the decrease in the levels of ED resulted in a decrease of this histone mark. In collaboration with Adam Cohen, who used to be a postdoctoral fellow in my lab and now has his own lab in Israel, 
we uh, wanted to profile the human SCC, the primary tumors that isolated after surgery versus normal uh, control epidermis from the same patients to see whether or not the histone mark is changing on the gene levels and which genes lose those histone mark. This is a cut and run data which we performed for this histone mark. And as you can see here from this heat maps, uh, obvious down regulation and it's quantified here. So in SCC samples, the level of this histone mark decreases. And on the genes, what are the genes that where they normally had this histone mark present, but now this histone mark is decreased? We saw that many of the proliferation genes, cancer stemness genes, including PITX1 and SOX2, that Mark Vashorba and Cedric Blampin showed to be a critical uh, transcriptional regulators required for SCC formation. Again, they repressed by PRC2 complex, normal keratinocytes, and the level of the histone mark decrease in SCC samples. And we also saw EMT uh, genes um, uh, under the same regulation. We also then, we, we use mouse models. We wanted to see if we generate mice, uh, uh, SCC in mice, do we see the same patterns, the same phenotypes? So we use DMBA protocol to generate SCC. This is a chemical cartilaginous protocol, which is after a few months will result in SCC formation in the back skin of treated mice. And as you can see here, we saw the same results. HGK27 ED were present in the normal skin and decreased in SCC tumors. So basically at this point, we wanted to know if uh, during tumor genesis, the ED and HGK27 goes down. And we wanted to know what if we start with the situation when this histone mark is absent, will this promote SCC tumor genesis? And we can do this experiment by using uh, our inducible conditional knockout mice where we use K14-CRE-R system to ablate ED, the gene that goes down in SEC, ablate only in epidermis and nowhere else. We generate knockouts first, and then we subject them to DMBA treatment. And as you can see here in this ED knockout mice that lost ED in HDK27, the tumors are formed more, the more often in those tumors, there are many more tumors compared to control. They formed faster compared to control. And by histology, they saw more developed SCC than their control uh, counterpart. When we took those tumors, did histology, again, the disorganization of laminin-5, increase in case 17, and increase in twi twist signal, again, telling us that um, without ED and HDK27, there is acceleration of SCC tumor genesis. We also looked at metastasis. A metastasis in, is in general in, in, in mice and undergoing DMBA treatment is quite hard to develop. However, in this case, we saw that um, the mice that underwent DMBA treatment are ED knockout mice. The lymph nodes of those mice were much bigger. And when we sectioned it, we saw that now presence of epithelial cells, um, obvious by histology, as well as by staining because they express the K14 and K17 markers of epithelial cells. And this is a control mice that was subjected to DMBA, and this is a wild type mice that uh, did not undergo any treatments. And the cells, the epithelial cells that migrated to the lymph nodes were negative for this histomark, telling us that they came from the tumors that were AED knockouts. So to this stage, we, our data said that loss of HDK27 methylation promotes tumor genesis. And we thought, what if we take the SCC tumors and what if we, if we can, for example, put this histone mark back, can we revert SCC tumor genesis? I know this sounded at the beginning to us kind of crazy, but then when we revisited the tumors, we, as um, I told you before, we only saw that ED goes down in SCC tumors. And this is I'm showing you the IF analysis of mouse tumors that underwent DMBA treatment. So they are the normal wild type mice that underwent DMBA tumor genesis protocol and resulted in SCC tumors. The EZH2 and SUS12, these subunits of the PRC2 complex are present and the only thing that is reduced uh, was ED. So then we hypothesize, what if we take SCC tumors and we re-express ED, can we revert SCC tumor genesis? So we did the studies together in collaboration with Marcus Schober from NYU, and we did it because Marcos has established several cell lines which he uh, isolated from SCC tumors in mice 
This had the wild type mice that underwent SC, uh, a DMBA tumor genesis protocol. He then established SCC cell lines in vitro, and then he called them tumor propagating cells because he can take those cells and transplant them back into mice and they will form SCC tumors. So we took those cell lines that Marcus nicely shared with us and engineered them to either express a control vector or ED to re-express ED in the cells. So as you can see here, this is a Western blot. HDK27 increased in cells that re-expressed ED, telling us that when we put back ED, it can assemble back into PRC2 complex, resulting in increase in this level of the histone mark. And then when we monitor the proliferation of those cells compared to the empty vector control, we saw that these are the green cells that express ED. The cells grow slower in vitro compared to the empty vector control. To assay for tumor genesis, we did two assays. We did in vitro. It's a colony formation, a, a soft agar colony assay. When you play the cells in a soft agar and you see how they can grow on, in this assay, as you can see here, the cells that they express ED cannot grow as good a form this colony compared to the empty vector controls. And then if we take those cells now and inject into mice, we wanted to know uh, in vivo, do they have potency to form tumors? And again, as I said, the cells are, are, are capable normally to form tumors upon, transplant, upon injection into the nude mice. And they can do that when they express empty vector control, but when they express ED, the tumor's volume and weight is drastically reduced compared to the empty vectors. So what we think is happening is that during uh, uh, SEC formation, during this tumor genesis induction, the oncogenic mutations results in uh, tumor formation and also result in a reduction in the levels of ED, leading to reduction in the level of this histone mark. We analyzed that in normal epidermal cells, many of the SCC oncogenes that control proliferation, EMT, or just promoting the SCC tumor genesis that those transcription factors are under PRC2 depression. When SCC is being formed, AD goes down, and those oncogenes are now expressed, promoting SCC tumor genesis. And if we take those SCC cells, now uh, the cells that uh, have low level of AD, and we re-express AD in those cells, we see that SCC tumor genesis is attenuated. And now we're exploring if we now indeed those oncogenes are now being targeted by PRC2 depression, leading to their inactivation. So I think I covered all of this uh, conclusions now, and I will move to the final slide to my acknowledgement. As you can see, I kind of showed you many stories for many of those uh, people who did this work already left, and they now are they study their own independent positions so the transition to postdoctoral trainings. And I just want to acknowledge the people that uh, for some of the stories that I shared with you that I still in the lab. Puja Flora contributed a lot to their um, Merkel cell part and the TNC studies. And Minyan Lee is the one who did all the EZH, oh, PRC2 uh, SCC work. And I'm very grateful to other lab members that are doing many exciting work, um, our collaborators, and uh, of course, our funding agency. And I will stop here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Elena, great talk. Uh, in the first part of your talk, you you spoke about the Merkel cell transcription factors and how PRC is recruited there. What is recruiting that? Is that SOX2? Yes, let me, yeah, let's discuss this because I, I did not tell you one important information I kind of decided to, let, let's go to this slide. So um, as you can see, there's many more Merkel cells are formed. What I didn't tell you is that these Merkel cells are formed still formed around hair follicles, but just now all of the hair follicles, this 100% of them, not only the guard hairs, harboring the Merkel cells, okay? And this, and the reason for it, uh, we think is the following. Now I'm going to go to the model. The SOX, and this is because the SOX9 cells are present in all hair follicles. All hair follicles, and through the genetic experiment, shows that all hair follicles are capable to give right Merkel cells. And SOX9 population is present in all of them. But why it's only happening around this guard hairs, the 3% of all the hair coat, and not happening in others. So what we think is that um, normally during development, the guard hairs are formed first, and then the other types of hair are formed a few days later. So what we think, and 
this is a hypothesis that we don't have uh, yet evidence for that. We think that during development, uh, the polycom maybe in early development is very promiscuous. Maybe it's not even repressing the Merkel cell lineage. Therefore, as soon as SOX9 cells are specified and the proper signals are coming, and we showed one of those signals is FGFR signaling. Then the SOX9 cells, when FGFR signaling comes, go and become Merkel cells. What we think that the reason why other hair follicles do not form Merkel cells despite presence of SOX9 cells is because now the polycom complex is repressing those genes and there's nothing removing them, okay? So what we think is that early when the guard hairs are present when the only hair code is present, Merkel cells, uh, sorry, the, this key genes just not repressed by the polycom complex and later on they become repressed and nothing is removing them. So what we are deciding now how to test this hypothesis because it will require to isolate the cells from a different hair follicle types. And that is a little bit tricky, but um, we are thinking how to do this. Thanks, and then one other quick question. Um, where you talked about the PRC1 positively regulating the epidermal uh, integrity um, genes. Have you considered why we, or bring one YY1 binding protein as being part of that positively regulating complex? Yes, that's a very good question. Is what recruits it if it's involved in transcriptional activation, what recruits it? We are thinking how to do this. We think it, it doesn't go directly through uh, PRC1 just comes to the promoters. I think there's some recruiter protein and we are really uh, thinking how to analyze this because there's this, this is a very important question, what recruits it? Yeah. I think my question overlaps quite a lot with that one, which is the activating function of these PRC1 complexes. So I guess specifically, have you tested whether there are different complex components for those transcriptionally activating PRC1 complexes, for example, identifying interacting partners um, or, or what's binding those specific promoters where they're already active genes and it's promoting activation? Great question. Yes, and when we submitted that paper for review, this is exactly what we were asked. And the reason for it is that there are six PRC1 complex, subcomplexes, and they have all have ring 1A, ring 1B, but they all have other different subunits uh, are part of those uh, complexes. What we did is that for that paper, we actually ablated individually each of those, and we also did chip 6 studies for each, as many as we could do for components of these complexes. And it seems to be that we could detect the presence of different PRC1 subcomplexes at those genes, at some genes more, at some genes less, but it was not like uh, just one complex, one subcomplex is present. And genetically, when we ablated just, let's say, PRC1.1 or PRC1.6, we could not recapitulate the phenotype. So individual knockouts of the sum complexes did not have this global phenotype that we did with ring 1A, ring 1B. And again, because ring 1A, ring 1B is present in all of them. So our working hypothesis was that there's a redundancy between those PRC1 complexes, subcomplexes. Um, and we initially started doing this by crossing between those two subcomplexes or different subcomplexes to see if we do PRC1.1 with PRC1.6, can we have the same phenotype as ring one ab That's just a lot of mouse mating. We had to stop it during pandemic, but this is uh, at least what we have so far, a lot of redundancy of binding and genetically none of individual one can recapitulate the global ring one ab knockout that we saw. Uh, I'm gonna piggyback on these two questions. Um, okay. So it's differential recruitment or there's different ones making these marks, but at the end of the day, the mark is the same. How do you think the cell processes it or interprets that mark differently to be activating? Yes, very good question. Um, let me let me show you one difference between the mark, because I think it's, I, I did not uh, emphasize that. So repressed genes have much stronger level of their, uh, of the mark. Um, whereas the transcriptionally active genes had barely any mark. What we also did for that paper is we um, generate a mouse where ring 1B was present, but it was catalytically inactive. So it just cannot ubiquitinylate. And so we wanted to know which of the roles as a depressor or the activator um, uh, play a role and therefore the uh, H2 ubiquitinylation. So the long story short is the repressive activities are absolutely dependent on uh, catalytic activity of ring 1B, but gene activating activity or not. 
So PRC1, uh, in that case, uh, uh, the, the, the presence of this histone mark, we still do not know why is it there, but by the trucks, it's very, very minimal. So I don't know if it has a role, but genetically, it doesn't look like. So it seems to be that PRC1 as a, as a complex play these roles rather than through uh, histone mark regulation. Elena, I have a quick question. Um, you started your talk, I mean, beautiful talk. You started it in um, the touching, the light sensation. Um, I was wondering if different areas in the body have different organization of the molecular cells, because clearly in our tip of our hands, we don't have hair follicles, for example. So can it be that there are different mechanisms for Merkel cell um, specification in different areas within the same organ that we call the skin? Yes, very good question. So we also, we were very interested in that question. And then what we did, we, as you said, uh, we studied and the field in general studies Merkel cells in the back skin of mice because it has this beautiful organization of the touch dome. And it's just so clearly you can see it and it's so beautifully organized. But as you said, we have in mice and us as well, have a lot of Merkel cells in our fingertips, right? The same thing with mice. They don't have any hair. So what we did is that we isolated Merkel cells from the back skin, from whiskers of mice that also have a lot of Merkel cells and from the fingertips. And we profiled them. We saw, are they different at all? The answer is no, they're not different. They are, they absolutely, they are identical, at least from analysis that we performed. So, so they are the same. Organization is very different. They don't have this touch them organization because touch them you can even see on the histology, this, I, uh, TNC cells have this columnar structure. None of this is uh, present in the glabrous skin. In, with respect to the progenitors, we did um, lineage tracing using our reporters, and uh, we have we have we are doing it for a TNC reporter, but for at least for SOX9, it doesn't seem to be tra uh, tracking uh, tracing uh, in uh, fingertips, right, in in footpaths. So it seems to be that at least SOX9 population. Um, either not present or, or this population does not express SOX9 in a glabrous skin. We also show that SOX9 as a transcription factor, if you think about SOX9 positive cells, if you ablate SOX9, is SOX9 as a transcription factor required? So actually SOX9 itself is not required for Merkel cell lineage. So it seems to be that cells express SOX9, the progenitor cells express SOX9, but SOX9 itself is not required. So it could be just a marker that the hair follicle is expressed and those cells are give rise to Merkel cells. So um, the long story short to basically answer your question is, yes, we focus on the back skin. The Merkel cells are the same by transcriptional profiling. Um, we are moving now, we want to move to the glabrous skin and see whether or not, or, or what is the population there that regenerate Merkel cells. Simple like SOX9 lineage tracing showed us at least it's not labeling anything there. So it either a different population or just maybe the same population, but SOX9 is just a marker in the glabrous skin, but not in, oh, sorry, in a hairy skin, but not in the glabrous skin. So yeah, this is a very good question. What, if any, are the specific Merkel neurotransmitters released? Right. So we have not worked on this, but the beautiful work from Ellen Lumpkin, who used to be at Columbia University and now moved to Berkeley, actually, show that uh, norepinephrine sorry, uh, is released by Merkel cells. So it's synthesized by Merkel cell and released. So if there's others, I think she's probably studying that. We, I think this is a very interesting question, but we, we're not going into that. The questioner was impressed with how many genes in Merkel cell differentiation are also neural specific. Yeah. SOX2, yeah. islet one yeah. So the question was, Twofold one, do these Merkel cells diverge in development maybe earlier if, if, than the other parts of the skin? And the second, would it actually be easier to convert, transdifferentiate a Merkel cell into a neural cell than perhaps other as, other skin types? Um, yes. Yeah, so the in terms of uh, would it be easier? I don't know. We haven't tried. We also thought about it because even when we did profiling and you put them on PCA plot, Merkel cells are so far away from epidermal cells and hair follicle, like the hair follicle and the epidermal cells together and then 
Merkel sounds like something completely different. So um, we we don't yet have conditions to culture Merkel cells, and it's really because they're post mitotic cells. Mm. Even if you, uh, you know, an in injury that we did, or even when we put oncogenes that induce Merkel cell carcinoma formation, the studies done in mice, those cells can no longer proliferate. They're post mitotic done. So it's very, very hard to, to work with Merkel cells in vitro, and we don't yet have in vitro assay to differentiate them. So I don't know if, if that would be easier to differentiate, but um, to culture them is very hard. And in terms of the, the timing, it seems to be, at least from our work, that everything is kind of happening at the same time. So it's not that Merkel cells are formed first, and then the hair, and then the epidermis. It's kind of all happening at the same time. So it's very interesting that, as you said, or the, or the person who asked, how these completely different lineages are know how to properly... Uh, properly form. So this is, uh, I think the signaling events and how it's controlled, it's, it's still we need to investigate. Okay. I think this is the last question. I'll, I'll combine uh, two questions. One, again, it gets back to the, to the nervous system relationship. And it would seem that Merkel cell development and peripheral nervous system development must be very tightly coordinated. Uh, could you comment on that? And then the second thing, when you showed the regeneration of the Merkel cells in your experiment, what was going on with the peripheral nervous system too, since its targets were lost? Yes, thank you. Yes, I didn't have time to show that data. Yes, of course, we investigated that. So the previous studies that um, uh, show that when you ablate 8 to 1 transcription factors, there's no Merkel cells are formed. Actually, the innervation of the skin still occurring at the proper uh, locations and proper uh, areas. So there, it seems that um, there, there, the innervation is occurring, uh, and and then somehow there's a connection established between Merkel cells and sensory neurons. In our experiments, we checked if the sensory neurons are now innervating those ectopic Merkel cells, and they do, at least from what we could see. We could not perform, uh, we did not perform um, any recording. So we, we did not sort of, uh, I asked the question if those connections are functional. So this, we don't know, but there just analysis of IF and EM, we see that the sensory neurons do start innervating Merkel, this ectopic Merkel cells. Well, I have a last question, maybe just to kind of wrap it up. Um, and go into the cancer. Um, so you showed also that few of the genes that are open without the polycom complex in the SEC um, are vimentin, for example. Those that are responsible, or what we see at least, that are um, undergoing upregulation for the EMT transition, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, right. which is important to the metastatic kind of potential. Um, do you see that that complex, at least, is more important, or do you see the um, um, reduction of the polycom complex more in the EMT transition, in the transition to, into the EMT phase, or actually at the beginning when those mutations are formed all of a sudden, you know, you see all the reduction of A3K trimethyl? So I, I think both. I think that it's involved in both. And the reason for it is the following. If we generate uh, our mice and without uh, any DMBA treatment, just to look at them, what happens? The epidermis of this mice is hyperplastic. Epidermal progenitors start to uh, proliferate more than they would otherwise. There's no barrier defect, but the proliferation of those cells increases. And we're doing now analysis, is it self-renewal versus differentiation that is affected um, through this uh, uh, disbalance now and loss of HDK27. But we also think that uh, there's a, a changes uh, that to induce EMT because when we isolate the tumors, we see that um, there, uh, there's a cluster of genes that are involved in EMT that being expressed more in those cell types in, in our knockouts compared to control. We see that environment is very disorganized also. So, for example, there's more CAFs, uh, fibroblasts present in those tumors when we did single cell RNA sequencing studies. There is a very interesting data on macrophages uh, that we also see more. So. I think that there could be also, in addition to EMT genes being more upregulated, 
that the cells start secreting something, some maybe paracrine factors that start rewiring the environment. So then metastasis is not simple EMT, but also the environment changed. And then um, the cells are uh, uh, end up in the lymph nodes, and we see now we want to see uh, if we can prolong those mice to live if they uh, are now going to lungs and, and etc. So I think I honestly think it's both, at least from our data. We're pleased to thank Elena. Thank you so much for sharing this great data with us, and we'll see you all uh, for the March installment of the Southern California Stem Cell Consortium. See you then. Thank you.